I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and also apologize again for the delay in, in giving this seminar. Um, so the title should have been 150 years of the periodic table, but since it's a year late, 151 uh, from a nuclear physics perspective. Um, so last year uh, was the international year of the periodic table. It was the 150th uh, anniversary of the periodic table of elements published by the Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev in 1869. Here you can see the world's largest version of the table on the wall of the chemistry department of the University of Murcia in Spain. Uh, in its first version, the table had 63 elements and it now has uh, 118 uh, with the newest additions in two uh, 2015. So Nihonium, Moscovium, Tennessine and Organisson. So these elements, uh, uh, they complete the seventh uh, row uh, or seventh period of, of the table. They were discovered by a nuclear physicist and in fact are the culmination uh, of, of a long work that began more than 100 years ago and which we'll now retrace together. So why 100 years ago? Well, more than 100 now, but roughly 100, and, well, in 2011, in fact, uh, the physicist uh, Ernest Rutherford publishes an article in which he comes to the conclusion that the atom uh, must have at its center a uh, small nucleus which concentrate all the positive charge of, of the atom. The same year, Marie Curie receives her second Nobel Prize uh, for the discovery of two new elements, radium and polonium. Uh, these two events are, are linked, uh, but not only historically, but also because without Marie Curie's radium and polonium, Rutherford would have never gotten to this conclusion and also uh, until the 30s, 1930s, ra intense radioactive sources of radium and polonium will be the only available means to probe the inner structure of the atom, as we shall see. So, but before we go on from 1911 onwards, let's take a step back in time and examine in what context these two discoveries occurred. Um, so at the turn of the century, last century, um, many physicists believe that there was nothing new to, to be discovered. Uh, and there's this famous sentence attributed to William Thompson, which is probably wrongly attributed, but there's nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurements. And why was that? Well, because there were Newton's laws of motion and gravitation, Maxwell's electromagnetism, the laws of thermodynamics and statistical physics, and all these uh, could explain more or less uh, everything that was observed. Uh, as for the constituents of matter, one of the prevailing theories uh, was the one of John Dalton, uh, who uh, imagines the atom uh, like a billiard ball, and all the atoms of a given element are the same. And what distinguishes uh, the atoms of different elements is the mass. And so that's why uh, very early on, elements were classified uh, according to their mass and tables were devised to account uh, for the regularities uh, observed in the chemical behavior of the, of the elements. And the most famous table, uh, and the one which is still used today, uh, is Mendeleev's table, uh, which you see here, the first version, in which all the elements uh, are, uh, are put in, all the known elements at the time, uh, are put in the table as a function of their increasing mass. And all the elements in a given row uh, are, uh, have similar chemical properties. Now, each element's uh, position in the table is given by the letter Z, which uh, right now doesn't have any physical meaning. It just comes from the German Atom Zal, so number. Now, the success of Mendeleev's table was that he questioned some masses. You see some question marks with where some masses he thinks maybe should be remeasured. Uh, and also he left empty spaces uh, where he thought that the, the, uh, there should be an element with given set of properties, for example, 68, 70. And, and indeed, um, before 1900, the elements gallium, germanium, and scandium uh, were discovered. So this table was predictive in a sense. Now, what he hadn't predicted were the noble gases, 
since they are inert, which don't react chemically, but they will, will soon be discovered by Ramsey. So it did seem like the physics of the time could give satisfactory explanation for all the observed phenomena. There were, however, a couple of clouds uh, in, the, in the blue sky of theory, theoretical physics, and the term cloud is, is attributed to Lord Kelvin again, uh, who thought that it was only a matter of time before these clouds would, would disappear. So the first cloud uh, was the spectral distribution of thermal radiation from matter. Uh, as you know, when you heat an object, it emits electromagnetic waves of a particular wavelength, which depends solely on the temperature. Uh, now, the problem was that the classical theory uh, expected an infinite number of radiation modes at small wavelength. That's what was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. So this problem was solved empirically by Max Planck, who could fit the experimental data with the formula. But the formula implied that matter could only absorb or emit radiation in discrete packets um, that he called a quanta proportional to uh, their frequency. Uh, uh, so this was something new. Uh, <laughs> but some years later, Albert Einstein uh, goes a step further and proposes that Planck's quantization, in fact, is, is due to the granular structure of light. His idea is that light is made up of, of photon and photons, and, and it's with this hypothesis that it actually uh, explains the known photoelectric effect for which he will receive his one and only Nobel Prize much later in 1921. So the other cloud uh, is related, so not to the corpuscular nature of light, but to its wave uh, nature. So as waves propagate in water and, and sound propagates in air, people thought naturally that uh, uh, light should propagate in some sort of medium, which they called ether. Now the velocity of light, which appears in Maxwell's equations, uh, would therefore correspond to the velocity um, to the speed of light in ether. And so anybody in movement uh, with respect to this wind of ether uh, should measure a different speed uh, of light. And many experiments were devised to try and, and, and evidence this. And the most famous experiment is the michelson morley interferometry experiment, but they all failed. And, and, uh, and Einstein comes to the rescue again. And so to re reconcile uh, Maxwell's equations with the Galilean relativity, uh, he <clears throat> comes up with his theory uh, of special relativity, uh, which states that the laws of physics remain unchanged in an initial frame and that the speed of light is the same in all inertial frames. Uh, and a direct consequence of this is length contractions and dilations of time, and obviously uh, the equivalence of mass and energy, which as we shall see, and as you know, has a, a special importance in the subatomic world. So as you see, there's a quantum and relativistic revolution on its way. Experimentally, the revolution comes from the ancestor of the television or, or the more precisely the Crookes tube, which is an evacuated glass tube with two metal electrodes. And when a high voltage is applied uh, between the electrodes, a so-called cathode ray appears. Cathode because it comes from the, <coughs> uh, from the, from the cathode, the negative. Uh, uh, electrode. And the rays travel in a straight light, in a straight uh, line, and when they hit the, the walls of this glass tube, they, they, it makes it glow. And this was all the craze in the salon uh, of the time, and if you made the, the, if you change the composition of the residual gas, then the, the lights would be different and so on. Uh, people didn't know what these cathode rays were, some thought they were waves, some thought were, they were particles, and it's Jean Perrin, who, who, um, who demonstrates that, in fact, they are negatively charged particles by deflecting them uh, with a magnet. Now, in Cambridge, uh, things go quickly when, uh, when uh, uh, Thomson, he improves the vacuum techniques and manages to superpose uh, a magnetic and an electric field, and he can measure uh, the charge to mass ratio of these particles. And, uh, he, he and, and he repeats the measurements for different cathode materials, uh, different residual gases, and he finds always the same thing. So he concludes that these particles, which are about 2,000 times lighter than hydrogen, uh, uh, which he calls uh, corp corpuscles, are the constituents of matter and that they're being uh, ripped from the cathode. Uh, 
and um, uh, and so he he uh, he he devises a, a model of the atom called the plum pudding model model for obvious reasons where the these electrons are bathing in a in a sea of of positive charge. Now, what actually happens in the tube, as as uh, as you all know, is that the ions in the in the gas. Uh, in, in the tube are in fact uh, accelerated towards the negative electrode. And when they arrive to the electrode, they hit it and eject electrons, which in turn uh, are accelerated to the, to the positive uh, uh, electrode. And we'll see the importance of these uh, ions, so this ion beam called canal rays uh, later on. So the cathode tube is also responsible for two other major discoveries, both of which happen a, a little bit by chance. The first one uh, occurs in, in Röntgen's laboratory uh, while he was studying the penetrability of cathode rays. So that he wouldn't be bothered by the glow of the cathode tube itself, he covered it with cardboard and was surprised to, to see that some paper treated with some barium, platinum, cyanide, salt, so some, some uh, fluorescent screen placed quite far away, uh, fluoresced strongly each time he applied the voltage uh, to, the, to the electrodes of the cathode tube. Um, uh, he, it, this, this couldn't be due to the cathode rays themselves, so he baptized these new, X, uh, these new rays X, X for unknown. And then he proceeded to insert various objects of different thicknesses and densities uh, to try and study these, uh, and these rays. And the most famous picture is, is, is um, the first X-ray of, of a hand, the hand of his wife, uh, as you see here. And this made, uh, when it was published, it went right around the world and it made quite a craze. It was the first time you could see inside somebody's body without having to cut them open. And so Rengen was the, the first uh, to receive the first Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901. And as you'll see, uh, most of the uh, uh, actors in this talk uh, will receive uh, the Nobel Prize, but I won't mention it specifically. So very soon after this, this uh, Rengen's, uh, Rengen publishes his work, very soon, Henri Poincaré, he reports this uh, new discovery at the Académie des Sciences in, in Paris, and he tentatively makes a, a link between the, 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 the glow of the glass Crookes tube and these X-rays. Uh, and so Henri Becquerel, who's in the audience and who is an expert in luminescence, as was his father, I mean, it's a family thing, uh, he decides to investigate this further. And by chance, again, he chooses to see if uranium salts uh, emit these X-rays. And as you all know, he will discover some other ray that we, he will call uranium rays uh, um, and that can um, uh, impress a photographic plate uh, and also uh, ionize air and, and, um, and discharge a charged uh, electroscope. So we're starting to have a lot of different rays appearing left, right, and center. And uh, this is when uh, a young Polish woman comes into play. Her name is Maria Slodowska, and she recently got married to Pierre Curie, and she's looking for a PhD subject. And so she decided to study these uranium rays, which are very fashionable at the time. She quickly discovers that thorium is also active. And with the help of her husband, she then proceeds to quantify uh, the activity of different materials. And she does so with a unique apparatus uh, capable of measuring very weak currents. And this is thanks to her husband and her brother-in-law. Uh, so this is this famous apparatus uh, in which the charge generated here in this ionization chamber uh, uh, make the dial of this um, electrometer um, turn. And this rotation is compensated uh, by a charge generator, the piezoelectric quartz, which had been discovered by the, the, the Curie brothers. So she could measure very, very tiny currents. And that's where compared to just measuring how an electroscope comes up and down, it was uh, thanks to this apparatus that she could actually come to the conclusions that she came to. So it was a long and tedious procedure because you needed to make chemical separations, measure the activities, then perform subsequent separations and on the most active fractions and so on. And in doing so, uh, she discovered uh, two uh, new very active substances. The first one in the bismuth fraction, which she called polonium, and the second uh, in the barium fraction, which she called radium. 
And in order to treat these large quantities of ores, basically to produce one gram of radium, they had to start from seven tons of uranium. They worked in an old hangar here, which you see here at the Ecole de Physique et Chimie Industrielle de Paris. And so <clears throat> Marie Curie calls this phenomen phenomenon radioactivity as it's no longer the sole property of uranium, thorium, and, and, and so on. At that time, uh, Rutherford, who, works to, who was working with Thompson, uh, decides to abandon his work uh, on the conduction properties of, of gases to study this new phenomenon at the University of McGill in Canada. And by studying the penetration properties of these uranium rays, the rays that were coming from the uranium, he discovers that there, there are at least two types uh, of radioactivity, which he calls alpha and beta, uh, with, with different uh, electrical and penetration properties. And in France, Paul Villard, he discovers a third type of radioactivity, which is neutral, uh, which he logically calls gamma. Now we know that alphas are helium ions, betas are electrons, and gammas are photons. So Rutherford then continues this work uh, with, uh, with a brilliant chemist called Frederick Soddy, and they demonstrate that uh, a radioactive species disintegrates uh, or transmutes into another one. And they establish the first decay series, such as, uh, such as this one, which goes from radium to emanation, which is obviously radon, and then different other species, which they call by strange names, um, and so on. Obviously, later it was found that this particular series corresponds to um, uh, the decay uh, of, of radium-226 and ends up in stable lead-206. They also showed that this uh, rate of transmutation uh, followed an exponential curve and introduced the concept of half-life. So he, Rutherford leaves uh, Canada and comes back to uh, Manchester and he continues his search on radioactivity and more particularly on the properties of alpha particles, which he has proven, uh, which he has shown with, with, uh, with the roids, that they are indeed helium atoms, helium ions, sorry. So um, this is the, the famous, uh, this time, uh, uh, so he, he, this is when he does his famous alpha scattering experiment, uh, which he performs with um, uh, his assistant, Heinz Geiger, and a student, uh, Ernest Marsden. And so um, what, what does the, con the experiment consist of? It's a very intense uh, source, 0.1 Curie, uh, in a collimator and a very thin foil. And, um, here you see there's a, there's a little sort of a, um, a microscope um, where you, there was a screen that flashed when an alpha particle hit the, 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 the screen. And you had to sit in total darkness and count uh, the number of flashes that you saw at a given angle. It was a tedious job, very straining. And no wonder that then Geiger went along and developed something a bit more um, uh, sort of automated, the Geiger counter. Um, and as expected, most of the alpha particles just were hardly uh, deflected by the gold foil. But what was totally baffling is that some particles were scattered at large angles. And uh, this is the famous sentence that Rutherford would say, it was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. So um, th this was this in within the gold uh, within the plum pudding vision of the atom. Such such a result was not understood, and it took um, uh, it took many years of thinking, two years of thinking, and taking statistical physics courses and and more experiments for Rutherford to the, come to the conclusion that instead of having this. Uh, glue of positive charge everywhere in the in the nuke in the atom uh, all the positive charge had to be concentrated in a very small um, nucleus uh, and so assuming a point like source uh, Rutherford could reproduce um, the scattering data um, and so uh, basically the the nucleus uh, was born so um, so you can really speak about nuclear physics from 1911. Now, two things came uh, out of Rutherford's atomic model. The first is, uh, is that matter is pretty empty. Um, and, and the second one is that uh, uh, the Rutherford's atom was unstable because uh, these electrons that were around uh, the nucleus would, would have to radiate and eventually collapse 
uh, onto the nucleus. So this problem, luckily, was solved empirically by a young Dane who was working in uh, Rutherford's group in Manchester, Neil Spohr. So what does he do? He postulates that the electrons move around uh, in, in, in orbits of fixed size and energy and explains the emission spectrum of atoms, which was known, in terms of electronic jumps between orbits. And this model worked quite well for the hydrogen uh, atom, uh, but it, it fails to explain why some lines are more intense than others, and it fails for atoms with more than one electron. However, this sort of uh, marks the beginning of, of a new field, uh, quantum mechanics, which we'll come back to later on. So. Um, uh, experimentally, things are getting very complicated because since the discovery of radioactivity, more than 40 radio elements uh, are discovered in the space of 15 years. Uh, you see some radio elements in, in, <clears throat> in the decay here of, of uranium and thorium, all with strange names. Um, but there are only seven empty spaces in the periodic table between bismuth and uranium. So where do these all fit? And there's another problem, uh, it, basically a chemical one. Um, some of these radio elements, for example, radium B, actinium B, radium D, actinium E, are inseparable uh, chemically. Uh, same thing for mesothorium uh, one and thorium X. And so chemical inseparability uh, generally means chemical identity. And so uh, Saudi sort of to fix this problem comes with the, the concept of, of isotope. Uh, which, uh, according to which radioactive elements um, um, can have uh, uh, the same chemical properties, but different masses. Um, so this concept uh, was, was totally at odds with Dalton's concept of the properties of elements, depending on their mass and how people um, thought the periodic table worked. So, so uh, how was this problem solved? Very quickly, in fact with a young collaborator of Rutherford, Henry Mosley. So what he did is he used the very brand new Bragg diffraction and Bragg's law to measure the frequency of the high frequency X-ray emission from nearly all the elements in the periodic table. Uh, here you see some, some diffraction patterns um, for various uh, elements. Uh, it was known from Charles Barkla of uh, Liverpool, I think, um, that when you bombard a, a, a species with x-rays, this, this species emits a characteristic x-rays. And there was a high frequency called that, they call, that he called K and a lower frequency radiation called L. And what Mosley discovered uh, was a correlation between uh, the atomic number, so the place in the periodic table, so this famous Z, uh, and the square root of this frequency which meant that the atomic number was not just a number, but it actually had a physical meaning. Uh, but it took a, a year or so for, to figure it out. Uh, um, um, so in, in, in the light of Bohr's atomic shell model, it was understood that, um, uh, that in fact, the, the atomic number was the charge of, of the nucleus. Uh, and, uh, and periodicities um, of the periodic table could be explained uh, in terms of filling uh, of electronic shells. So this result, in fact, had great impact on the community, larger maybe even than Rutherford's discovery of the nucleus. Um, Mosley would have probably been awarded a Nobel Prize for this result. Um, however, he died tragically in World War I, which started just after um, these results. So after World War I, the world witnessed another great result, and this was the alchemist's dream come true, the first man-made transmutation. Rutherford observed that uh, um, nitrogen could be disintegrated by firing alpha particles onto it. And since hydrogen was released uh, in, in this reaction, um, he, he basically thought uh, that, um, that um, hydrogen was being ejected from the nucleus by the incident alpha particles. And he calls uh, this hydrogen, he calls it proton, um, because uh, meaning first, I mean, the, the main uh, comp component of, of, of matter. Uh, but he was convinced that hydrogen is being ejected 
from the nucleus and he asks um, Patrick Blackett to use a cloud chamber uh, to visualize uh, uh, the tracks of such disintegration. And the poor Blackett had to analyze hundreds of thousands of tracks. And he found eight of them that were forked like this, uh, like this one, helium comes onto the nitrogen and then you have uh, uh, the proton. So the hydrogen coming out uh, and oxygen 17 coming out. But, it, but in fact, um, what, what, it, what this uh, photograph shows is that um, um, the combination of the alpha particle and the nitrogen had in fact formed an atom of fluorine, which then disintegrated into oxygen and, and a proton. So you were not stripping uh, simply uh, protons from the nitrogen. But anyway, so if we resume what people thought uh, the nucleus was at the time, they thought that uh, the nucleus was composed of A protons and A minus Z electrons. Uh, and, um, uh, but already in 1920, Rutherford thinks, well, if an electron can bind two hydrogens, uh, then surely one electron uh, can bind one proton. And so he suggests the existence of this electron-proton pair, which would have all the correct characteristics of a neutral particle. This, suggest this suggestion, however, goes remains unnoticed uh, around the world, uh, except at the Cavendish lab in Cambridge, where Rutherford is appointed director. And we'll see that this is an importance for the discovery of, of the neutron. Um, so at Cambridge, uh, Francis Aston, who's been working with Thomson on the canal rays, remember the ion beam which appears in the Cook Crookes tube, he provides a, a experimental proof uh, of the existence of isotopes. Um, what he does is he builds this first mass spect spectrograph, which focuses on, on, at the same point, all the ions with the same ratio of mass to charge. You see here, for example, two examples of, of, of spectra uh, recorded, well, it's photographs record, um, so the, the spectra of mass to charge ratio recorded on, on the photographic plate at the end of the spectrograph. When the tube is filled, so when, the, when this tube is filled with either neon, uh, which is this case, um, uh, or chlorine, uh, which is this case. And, and you see that for the neon case, you see uh, two major lines, one at 20, mass 20, and the other one at 22, and chlorine, you have 35 and 37. There are other lines that appear, and these are calibration or reference lines or, or some, some other compounds present. Um, so <clears throat> this proves that isotopes exist not only for radioactive species, but also for stable uh, species. He also establishes that all the masses are whole numbers uh, with the exception of hydrogen, which is a little bit more uh, heavy, uh, he heavier. So uh, as, as hydrogen uh, is, is the building block for all the other heavier nuclei, Francis Aston proposed that in fact, <clears throat> mass is lost when forming nuclei. Since for example, in the vision of the time, huh, four hydrogens weigh more than a helium um, atom. And so, um, and in fact, uh, uh, Eddington suggests that mm, the transformation of hydrogen into helium could be the source of the sun's energy. Uh, and uh, Francis Aston re receives the Nobel Prize in 1922 uh, for the whole number rule and, and, and the evidence of isotopes. And he warns of the dangers that might come uh, when researchers find out how to release such, such energy contained uh, in, in nuclei. However, the, the whole number rule sort of falls apart when he develops his, his, spectro his spectrometer and improves the resolution. And he finds out that in fact, the, the, the whole numbers are not exactly whole. Uh, and this is illustrated in the plot of this so-called packing fraction as a function of, of mass number, uh, which reflects the, the proportion of mass lost to forming nuclei. This curve basically tells how stable nuclei are. The smaller the packing fraction, the more stable the nucleus is. And this is in fact the binding energy in a sense of the nucleus. So theoretically, um, scientists around the world are trying to figure out uh, what Bohr's model of the atom means and why it works. And in the process, they're laying the foundations of, of a whole new field, as I mentioned, quantum mechanics. 
So Louis de Broglie, uh, he reinterprets Bohr's postulate uh, of um, electrons of occupying fixed orbitals uh, of, of fixed energy uh, as the condition of a, of, of a resonance, of a standing wave, a bit like a vibrating string. And in fact, um, this wave character of the electron is confirmed uh, the following year by the observation of electron diffraction patterns in two independent experiments. Uh, to explain the fine structure of the emission spectra of atoms, uh, Pauli states the exclusion principle that no more than one electron occupies the same quantum state and postulate that there has to be another quantum number. And in fact, two graduate students at the University of Leiden suggest, uh, so Aaron Fest students suggest that this property is, is electron spin. And so to describe these uh, electron waves, uh, the, the, the Schrodinger develops new wave mechanics. And at the same time, Heisenberg develops novel matrix algebra, which have special commutation rules implying the uncertainty principle. Uh, and Max Born reconciles everybody. So the particle and the wave-like description um, by giving a physical meaning to, to, to the wave function. So quantum mechanics is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is the emerging field and it's very quickly applied to the nuclear problem by George Gamow. It's applied to describe the alpha decay. So by sh uh, solving Schrodinger's equation of an alpha particle confined in the nucleus, um, he manages to come up <clears throat> with a relationship between the, uh, the, the, the lifetime, the half-life uh, of the emitting uh, uh, alpha particle um, to the energy of the alpha particle. This law was known experimentally as the geiger newton law. Um, and, and very soon after that, Salomon Rosenblum is able to identify the fine structure of the alpha decay lines in Paris. And, and what is not very commonly known is that George Gamow uh, interprets this as being due to the nucleus decaying to excited states in the daughter nucleus. Um, quantum mechanics is also responsible for the discovery of antimatter. Uh, it all starts with a brilliant English physicist, Paul Dirac, who loved playing around with equations. And so when he tried to make Schrodinger's equation relativistic, um, he came up with an equation which had two solutions. Uh, the first one being the electron, the one that he was looking for, and, and the second one of, of, of negative energy, <clears throat> which corresponds to a uh, to an electron hole or, or, or an anti-electron. Um, and, and in fact, so he postulates that there should be such a, such a thing. Uh, and it is discovered um, two years later by uh, uh, Carl Anderson who was studying cosmic rays. So this new theory uh, can, uh, can explain uh, laws that had been uh, empirically established and can, is also predictive. Um, so it's, it's gaining uh, its place, uh, although not many people understand it, and we still don't quite understand it these days. Uh, <clears throat> so but, so we, we see discoveries of new particles, and it's not the end uh, of the discovery of new particles. Um, it was known from James Chadwick since 1914 that the beta decay spectrum was not made up of discrete lines like the alpha spectrum was, but was continuous. Um, and so people didn't understand that because if you go from an initial state to a final state, the energy is, uh, um, is fixed. So people were even um, thinking that maybe the laws of conservation are violated in the atomics world. Um, Chadwick was convinced that he had made some silly mistake somewhere uh, and uh, kept on redoing the experiment, but still uh, he came to the same uh, conclusion. Um, and there was a famous calorimetric experiment performed by Ellis and Wooster, and they um, they confirmed that the en <clears throat> that the average electron energy is indeed less than the endpoint energy of the beta spectrum. So this this sort of energy problem finds a solution when Pauli uh, postulates the existence of a a neutral massless particle in the nucleus, which he calls um, neutronon. Um, uh, and which shares the energy um, with the beta electrons. And so that would solve the, 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 the problem. Uh, of course, this particle was, is the neutrino and it will be discovered much later in 1956. 
Um, and finally, we come to the discovery of the neutron, which is in fact, a, a, how do you say, a, a European effort. Uh, it, it's, uh, it sort of results from the work carried out in three labs. It all starts in Berlin, when uh, Bott and Becker discover a strange radiation emitted by a beryllium foil when bombarded by alpha particles. The radiation is neutral and is very penetrating. And at first they think it's uh, just high energy gamma rays. Uh, these experiments are then repeated in Paris by Irene Curie, the daughter of Marie and her husband, Frédéric Joliot. Um, they find out that this strange radiation uh, knocks out protons of paraffin and think that this could be sort of, sort of the same process as Compton scattering, uh, but involves a, pro, um, a photon um, uh, and a proton instead of a photon and an electron. Um, so they publish these results. And on reading these results, Chadwick knows immediately that this radiation is the famous neutral particle predicted by Rutherford back in, the 19, in 1920. And he goes about to prove it uh, repeating the experiment uh, with paraffin, with paraffin uh, but also other materials and measuring precisely uh, in an ionization chamber, the energy of the ejectiles. And he comp uh, comes to the conclusion that this radiation <clears throat> must have a mass of one. So because he knew what to look for and, and what experimental signatures uh, to look for, he, he could actually prove the existence of, of, of the neutron. And so very quickly models appear uh, com uh, of the nucleus composed of Z protons and A minus Z neutrons. And so in the space of what, 34 years, the vision of the atom has gone from the plum pudding of Thompson um, to the vision of the atom we still use today. And the presence uh, of neutrons in the nucleus uh, provides an explanation, a natural explanation for isotopes. Uh, um, as people understand then that an atom of a given charge Z and hence given chemical properties uh, can have different masses according to the number of neutrons present in the nucleus. Uh, the presence of, um, of the neutron also resolves some spin issues uh, and uh, the problem of confinement uh, of electrons within the nucleus because uh, that was also a problem that we didn't, uh, that people at the time, if, if the the electrons were inside the nucleus, then uh, they should have so much energy, given the uncertainty uh, principle, that they should escape from the nucleus. Um, so, but then if there are no more electrons in the nucleus, where do the electrons in the beta decay come from? And this is sort of uh, solved um, by, well, by Fermi, who develops a, a theory for beta decay. Um, by suggesting the existence of a new force, the weak force. So um, he uses Dirac's formalism um, and he states his, his, his well-known Fermi's golden rule. Um, so he submits this, uh, so a neutron changes into a proton at the same time as an electron uh, and Pauli's neutral particle. Uh, uh, he submits his theory for publication in Nature, and this is quite funny because uh, it will be rejected uh, because it contains speculation which were too remote uh, from reality. And that's why Fermi's theory was first published in Italian and German before finally it gets into Nature uh, in 1939. So um, <clears throat> the 1930s are also a turning point in experimental nuclear physics uh, with the advent of accelerators. Um, this is motivi motivated by the desire to probe the nucleus with more intensity and with a greater variety of incident energies, because until then they were limited to the energies of alpha decay, because those were the ones that were used to probe the nucleus, um, and they could only make so intense sources. Um, and so um, uh, John Walton and Ernest Cock Croft, encouraged by Rutherford, they build an electrostatic machine capable of producing a voltage difference about 800 kilovolts. According to Gamow's calculations, um, this should be sufficient for a proton to tunnel through the Coulomb barrier of light nuclei. And so what they built is this voltage multiplier made of diodes and capacitors. The protons are, are generated in a discharge tube up here in the, in the photo. Um, we, um, the target is situated 
down here, uh, um, where I think it must be either Cockroft or, or Walton looking through a tiny microscope uh, at the reactions going on. Uh, so, um, and you can also um, judge for yourself the radio protection conditions of such an experiment. Uh, but anyway, the, the, uh, with a, a, a 250 kilovolt proton beam, uh, Walton and Crowcroft split uh, a lithium atom into two alpha particles uh, and give the first experimental proof of uh, the equivalence of energy and mass. As if you treat this reaction classically, um, uh, you cannot explain the, the kinetic energies of the outgoing heliums. Um, so, but nevertheless, the, the difficulty of, of maintaining high voltages uh, and all the, uh, to, to, to go even further, led several physicists to propose accelerating particles by using a lower voltage more than once. Uh, this is what uh, Ernest uh, Lawrence proposes in Berkeley, based on an original idea of uh, the Norwegian engineer Widero. So Lawrence events uh, the cyclotron. Uh, particles are accelerated uh, uh, across a gap between two D-shaped magnets. Uh, so the magnetic region accelerates the particle in a, in a semicircle. And then uh, during, uh, when they cross the gap, they get a kick in energy. Uh, and so then they, they, their radii increase, increase. Uh, and then you uh, extract the ions uh, at the largest radii. The first uh, cyclotron here uh, can hold in the hand uh, and it allowed to, uh, to, to accelerate protons up to 80 kilovolts. Of course, if you make them bigger and bigger, uh, then you can get to higher and higher energies. And with a radius of 93 centimeters, uh, by 1936, uh, Berkeley was accelerating deutons uh, up to 8 MeV. So with the first accelerators coming online, scientists began to gather a whole body of information on the nucleus and on the nuclear interaction from scattering experiments. And so uh, they, in many ways, um, so they, they discovered there was a strong attractive interaction and a short range, repulsive at short distance and charge independent. Um, in many ways, the strong interaction between nucleons was like the forces binding uh, molecules of water within a liquid drop. And this liquid drop model um, will be used by Heisenberg, his student Weizsäcker, uh, in explaining uh, the stability um, and nuclear masses. Uh, Niels Bohr will base his compound nucleus uh, uh, on it to explain reaction dynamics. And as we shall see, the liquid drop will be crucial uh, to understand fission. But it also delayed uh, considerably the advent of uh, models based on individual particles since people like Bohr and Beta were, were categorically against the idea. So that, that was also a, a, a problem. Um, so um, in 1934, so we have accelerators coming online and in 1934, another discovery is gonna change the world of nuclear physics, um, the discovery of artificial radioactivity by Irene Curie and Frédéric Joliot. So they bombarded aluminum uh, with alpha particles. Uh, and what they noticed is that the activity of the product, the product, the product uh, did not stop when they removed the alpha source. And so they came to the conclusion that they, in fact, they had produced a radioactive phosphorus. Um, this discovery uh, opens up a whole new field of applications for radio elements, for, for example, medical diagnosis and treatment. And in fact, uh, Lawrence's brother, John is the first to use an artificial radio element for therapeutical purposes in 1936 already. So the discovery of artificial radioactivity leads to, to the discovery of, of elements that have no stable isotopes. This is the case of, of technetium, uh, for example, discovered by Emilio Segre in 1937. The name technetium obviously was chosen as it signifies made by technology, yeah. And uh, soon after, we'll have the only two other holes here in the table before uranium are astatine, which will be discovered in 1940, and promethium in 1945. And so, um, uh, and all, all, the, all the boxes in Mendeleev's table from hydrogen all the way to uranium are, are then filled. Um, so, 
coming back to this uh, artificial radioactivity, um, uh, this um, uh, Enrico Fermi um, sees the potential of this, and and what he use what he decides to do is instead of bombarding all sorts of elements or materials with alpha particles, he says, well, I'm going to use neutrons uh, because they don't carry an, any electric charge and they can probably interact more easily with the nucleus. And so he 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 discovers that slow neutrons uh, interact more readily and identifies. 40 new radioisotopes in three years. And what he also proposes is, is to um, irradiate heavy nuclei to produce even heavier and even new elements, uh, according to the process shown here. If a neutron in, um, interacts with the uranium-238 uh, nucleus, becomes obviously 239, which then um, could disintegrate into the next element, uh, element 93, and so on. And he even gives names to these elements, Ausonium and Esperium, which are poetic names um, for Italy. Um, so um, his results were criticized by only one person in the world. And that was a, a, a woman called Ida Nodak, who suggests that it can be conceivable that the nucleus breaks up into several large fragments, which would of course be isotopes of known elements but would not be neighbors of the irradiated element. But this idea uh, is ignored um, for some reason, and we'll see it has a large influence in, in the next slides. So Fermi is awarded the Nobel Prize for these results, also for having produced elements 93 and 94. Uh, but after receiving his Nobel Prize, he emigrates to the States with his wife and children um, to escape Mussolini's fascist regime, which had just promulgated the Manifesto of Race. Um, but um, these discoveries of new elements um, sparked a worldwide quest for heavier and heavier transuranic elements. And in Berlin, Otto Hahn, Lisa Meitner, and Fritz Strassmann, they repeat Fermi's experiments and identify many new activities. And they claim to have reached element uh, with uh, charge 96. Um, in Paris, Irene Curie and a collaborator um, claim identify a substance uh, with, a, with a given activity uh, behaving chemically very much like telanthanum. Um, and so if you look at the, tab the periodic table of the time, um, lanthanum would be sort of the homologue of actinium. Uh, but however, it's, it's very difficult to understand how, would, how one would get to actinium by shooting neutrons onto uranium. And people started to devise complicated schemes of N alpha, then DK, N alpha P, uh, and it, it didn't quite fit with by varying the neutron energies. It, it was very strange. And so um, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann now alone, because Lise Meitner, um, had to uh, quickly escape uh, from Nazi Germany and she went to Stockholm to work with Siegban. Um, they look into the French results and they perform detailed chemical analysis of everything. And then they come to, they have to come to the conclusion um, that in, they have not made neither radium nor actinium nor thorium nor anything, uh, but in fact, they have uh, produced barium, lanthanum and cerium. And it, they put in their paper that this is a difficult decision which contradicts all previous nuclear physics experiments. Before, whenever you were irradiated something with, with alphas or neutrons, you made something very close to your initial target material. And so here it, 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 was, uh, it was difficult to understand. Um, but Lise Meitner, who is still in contact with Otto Hahn, finds a solution to, to the problem with her nephew Otto Frisch. Um, and this is made possible because they both have in mind the liquid drop. Frisch, uh, he works at the Neospor, uh, he works with Neospor and Meitner, uh, she often saw Heisenberg and knew Weissiko well. So they have this in mind. And they visualize together how, um, how um, the absorption of a neutron um, by, uh, by uranium could, could lead to an instability and deformation of, of this drop. Uh, which could grow under the, the, the influence of the repulsion of, between the protons and ultimately lead to fission. And so the activities that everybody, including Fermi, for which he got his Nobel Prize, uh, had been measuring were not 
the activities of transuranic elements, but they were the activities of much lighter fission products. And they immediately realized that the quantity uh, of, uh, of energy released in such a process would be phenomenal. Um, and so uh, then they, um, mainly in the form of kinetic, kinetic energy of these fragments. And when Frisch returns to Copenhagen after this, it was in the Christmas break, he immediately performs the experiment and looks for a huge ionization signal, which he finds. Uh, this is also checked in, in, um, in Paris by Julio. And uh, Niels Bohr, uh, who is on his way to a conference in the States, is, is informed by Fritsch, uh, and he brings the news of fission to the new world. And together with the, um, the American uh, Wheeler, they in fact quickly come up with a theory of fission based on the liquid drop. And in fact, they predict that uranium-235, the rare isotope of the mixture in natural uranium, is responsible for fission by slow neutrons. And in 1939, if you look at the publications, there's it's just so many publications on fission in so little time. It was really active. So in Paris, uh, Joliot proves that on average, three neutrons are emitted in the fission process. Uh, and he sees the possibility of a chain reaction. Uh, one neutron going on to induce another fission and so on. And asks the son of Jean Perrin, um, who is a theoretical physicist, to calculate um, the requirements uh, for such a chain reaction to happen. Um, and so Francis Perrin introduces the concept of critical mass uh, and, uh, and also the idea of a moderator, which they um, will choose he heavy water. Patents are also filed for energy production, but also for perfecting explosive devices. So the entire stock of heavy water, the Norwegian uh, heavy water is borrowed and eight tons of uranium are procured from the Belgium Congo. Uh, however, this is 1939 and the German invasion stops the French effort. Uh, Joliot's co-workers go to England. Uh, so does the heavy water in fact. Uh, and in the uranium is buried in Morocco. Uh, and the fact that it was buried there means that after the war, uh, they, in fr France had quite a substantial stock of uranium and could start uh, their, uh, their program. Um, so, but all this research on fission is, is carried out, is carried on uh, by Fermi and Leo Zilar in the States and will lead to the Manhattan Project and the consequences that, that we all know. So, but despite the war, uh, nuclear physics continues to progress. And in 1940, Georgi Flerov and Perzak, they discover the very rare signal of the spontaneous fission of uranium in Leningrad. And so this brings to four types of classical radioactivity, the alpha radioactivity here in this chart of the nuclides in yellow for the heavier systems, but also uh, down here. Um, there's also the beta minus beta plus decays on either side of the, of the valley of stability where the stable nuclei in black lie, uh, fission for the very heaviest nuclei. And <clears throat> there's a fifth, Activity uh, gamma, uh, well, fourth if you beta is, is the same fourth, which occurs all throughout the chart. Um, now, what, what, what you see here, you see some orange dots here. This is proton radioactivity, which was discovered in the 60s. And in the 2000s, there was uh, also a new radioactivity discovered, two proton radioactivity. Um, so so that, that's the situation. Now, um, I've just told you that uh, the Otto Hahn and, and everybody, in fact, realized that when bombarding uh, uranium with, with uh, um, uh, neutrons, um, they were not making transuranium elements, but they were making fission fragments. But work on fission, in fact, by Macmillan and Abelson in Berkeley finally leads the way to the discovery of the long sought transuranium elements. Uh, what Macmillan realizes is that when you irradiate neut neut neutrons on uranium and you have a fission catcher here, since the fission fragments have sufficient kinetic energy to escape the uranium target, uh, they're caught here and you can see their typical um, here uh, activity plot of average activity plot of all these fission fragments. But then what he looked, he looked into the uranium layer and he saw that it was composed 
uh, of the well-known 2.3 day activity of uranium, but another substance which had a shorter, uh, longer, uh, sorry, the 2.3 uh, minute uh, uh, of, uh, of uranium and a, and a much longer uh, other substance, much longer lived other substance. And um, <clears throat> this new substance has none of the properties of rhenium, uh, but behaves like uranium. Um, and, um, and so uh, it, 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 he also, at some point they discarded it because it, it behaved like a rare earth and they thought, well, this is a very strange fission fragment that doesn't escape from the uranium layer. But in the end, Macmillan realized that it had to be element 93 uh, and he pushes uh, uh, studies of it. Um, and they realize that it's, so it behaves like uranium. This allows separation. And what they could demonstrate is that the, the activity of this new substance actually grows from the run of uranium-239. So they had actually proven that it was element 93, which he calls Neptunian, since Neptune comes after Uranus in our solar system. A year later, um, the, the alpha emitting daughter of another Neptunium isotope is identified by Seaborg and is naturally called plutonium, since if you follow on the solar system. But this result is, is, uh, remains unpublished until after the war for, for obvious reasons. Uh, now, uh, in the following years, irradiations using the newly discovered plutonium as target material revealed new activities, but there, were no, there was no way to isolate them chemically by oxidizing them to what they thought was the proper oxidization state assuming um, plutonium, neptunium, and uranium were, were a series starting with uranium. So then Seaborg proposes to reorganize the periodic table, starting a new series um, uh, at, um, at actinium, um, uh, implying that elements 95 here and 96 uh, would, would, have the, would have the same properties as europium and gadolinium. Uh, and so new element uh, 95 and 96 uh, are obtained by bombarding plutonium with alpha particles. Uh, um, and, uh, and, and the name americium and curium is, is in reference to this arrangement. For example, americium is opposed to europium, uh, so Europe and America, and curium is opposed to uh, Gadolin, who was a Finnish chemist opposed to Curie, who also was a chemist. So next came the discovery of berkelium and Californium uh, by bombarding of americium and curium tar targets with alpha particles. And their names were given in honor of the city and state in which th these were discovered. The next two elements are discovered by Giorso in the analysis of radioactive debris following the Ivy Mike thermonuclear explosion in the Pacific in 1952. So these elements had been produced by rapid capture of 15 and 17 neutrons and then subsequent beta decays all the way to fermium-255 or Einsteinium-253. The element uh, 101 with 101 protons is the last element to have been identified by chemical separation and represents really a tour de force, both in terms of uh, the intensity of the uh, alpha particle beam used and also the exoticity of the target, Einsteinium-253, containing 10 to the nine atoms, and which was produced in a reactor with one year of irradiation. Uh, so they used a new technique for isolating the products known as the recall technique. So what happens is that the nuclei resulting from the fusion of an atom of the target and the beam, they recall out of the target and are collected here on a thin sheet of gold which is then dissolved in acid for then chemical analysis. And at the height of the Cold War, the element uh, was named Mendelevium uh, by the Seaborg team uh, in honor of the Russian chemist whose periodic table had enabled so many new elements to be identified. So for the rest of the adventure, advances in theoretical physics uh, will turn everything upside down. And it all begins in 1948 when uh, uh, Maria Gopert Meyer, who was working with Teller in Chicago, was particularly interested in the abundance of elements. And she notes that some elements are much more abundant than others. They're also much more stable, as is shown here um, uh, in the difference between the 
theoretical binding energy and measured binding energy. And this is very reminiscent of uh, the ionization uh, energies, for example, in, in atoms. And, um, and so she, 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 she suggests a periodic structure of the nucleus in this publication. And there's no theory in this publication for a good reason. It's because um, uh, she was not able to reproduce these numbers, whatever the form of the potential that she chose, harmonic oscillator, square potential, anything. By solving Schrodinger's equation with these potentials, um, you, you could obtain um, uh, levels of energy um, with a particular filling by neutrons or protons, which would give a total number of 2, 8, 20, 40, but not the, the magic numbers, the, the, the numbers corresponding to these stable, more stable, more abundant uh, nuclei. And uh, it's Fermi who indeed solves the problem by one night, she's working late, she still can't figure it out. And in the doorway, he says, uh, is there any indication of spin orbit coupling? In other words, uh, is there a preferred direction of the spin of the nucleon with respect to its orbital uh, uh, motion? Uh, and the answer is, of course, yes. And Mayer sees this immediately and solves the problem in the night. And by adding this spin orbit coupling, which favors parallel coupling uh, and whose amplitude varies with the value of orbital momentum, uh, the position of some orbitals change and magically you get uh, the right occupation magic numbers. And she publishes this result. And at the same time in Europe, uh, somebody totally unrelated who didn't know of the work comes to the same conclusion. And in fact, together, they'll publish the first, uh, they'll get the Nobel Prize together um, and publish the first book on uh, nuclear shell structure. So this model gives hope to the hunters of new elements because at the time the liquid drop model um, predicts that uh, no elements um, should exist beyond Z equals 104. This is the uh, liquid drop predictions for spontaneous fission half-lives. And you see that they drop, 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 uh, basically because the, there is the fission barrier is, 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 uh, is, is coming to zero. Uh, and here you have the lifetime limit, which is the time that um, uh, needed for a nucleus to have some sort of electronic cloud. Um, and so, if, but if you take into account uh, the, the shell structure uh, evidenced by Maria Gopert Mayer's work, uh, then the picture changes totally. Uh, what happens is that you have a, a, a shell structure which digs uh, a well in this potential energy surface of the nucleus creating this fission barrier. And there are two things, either it creates a, a, a stabilizes nuclei in, in at zero deformation, but also it can stabilize nuclei at non-zero deformation uh, and an even higher deformation. And these are the famous fission isomers. And so the first theoretical calculations indicate that there's a region of super stability of nuclei, which is called the island of stability, located uh, around these 114 and, and 184. And this relaunches the race uh, for super heavy elements in Russia and also in Berkeley with some controversies about the paternity of the discoveries. And here I show you the, the, the device used by the Berkeley group to th synthesize element 106 by so-called hot fusion. So an intense um, oxygen 18 beam bombards uh, a californium target the products of the reaction leave the target and are carried away uh, by a helium gas jet. And they're deposited on this uh, uh, surface of this wheel, which turns and at regular intervals place the activity in front of detectors. Uh, and so by correlating the activities of the parent with those of the known son and grandson over time, Giorso and collaborators demonstrated the activity of, of Seaborgium uh, 263. And Seaborgium was named in, in 1994 in honor of, of, of Glenn Seaborg, who until very recently was the only living person to have an, uh, given his name to an element. So, but nevertheless, as you're getting heavier and heavier, the production rates of these heavy nuclei are, are getting smaller and also their lifetimes are getting smaller. So you can't, uh, so you have to change experimental methods. And this is what GSI did in Germany, near Darmstadt, with the de development of the Unilac accelerator source complex, which could accelerate heavy ions up to uranium, as well as um, this uh, uh, 
a recall separator uh, called SHIP, uh, which could um, uh, enable the nuclei um, of interest to be sent to an identification uh, station here in less than two microseconds from the time when they're produced. So uh, the other novelty was the use of the so-called cold fusion uh, sort of in this reaction um, with lead and, and or bismuth targets. In this case, it's lead. So nickel 62 impinges on lead. If they manage to fuse, it makes a, a very heavy darmstatium, which then just evaporates one neutron to cool down. And so the team of, of Hoffman, Ambruster, and Munzenberg, uh, they synthesize elements from borium, 107 all the way to Copernicium, 112. And in Japan, the Tour de Force was uh, made by uh, a Morita San's uh, team where they managed to uh, produce element 113 by such a very difficult reaction. Uh, they produced three events in the space of 10 years, not 10 full years. I think it was something like 563 days of beam on target. Uh, so it was quite, uh, no one is going to repeat that experiment. So the last synthesized elements have benefited from the very interesting properties of calcium-48. This is stable, very neutron rich, which makes it possible to produce uh, super heavy elements, quite uh, neutron, more neutron rich than the cold uh, fusion reaction. Uh, the disadvantage is that it's very rare and very expensive. And so the targets used are actinide targets. And here you see the Oak Ridge reactor in Tennessee, where 22 milligrams of berkelium-249 were synthesized. Um, uh, after synthesis, you have to get this to the experiment quite quickly because uh, the half-life of berkelium is only 320 days. Uh, and so then what happens is that you shoot the calcium onto this target. Uh, if the fusion occurs uh, and, it, and it survives fission, then you get your, your super heavy element uh, of interest um, but it's a very, 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 very small reaction uh, cross section of the order of one to 10 pico barns. So what does that mean? It means one projectile out of 10 to the 17 gives uh, a reaction of interest. And you see here the cross sections as you go up in charge, going down, 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 down. Uh, here you're making in nobelium, you're making one a second. Um, uh, in 110, one, um, and this is this famous 113 element where the, the, the cross section is tiny. So very challenging experiments. And in order to find this needle in the haystack, you need a very powerful separator. And in Dubna, the team of Yuri Organisian uses this gas-filled Dubna separator. And this is where the heaviest element known to man was made using, um, the reaction calcium 48 on californium, uh, the beam is, is separated out and then you take the products of interest to a decay station here quietly at the focal plane um, and then you wait for them to decay. And what was evidence was that uh, few chains of this type where organisson then decays to livermorium, fluorobium and then copernicium fissions. Uh, so all the heavy chains, the heaviest chains end up with fission uh, and so in order to check the assignments, what you do is you do cross bombardments. For example, you produce the daughter in a direct reaction and check that you have the same alpha energies and lifetimes and the same chains and so on. So it's consistently, consistently checked. Um, okay, I will come. So Organisson has completes the seventh row of the periodic table and it, it, it sits in the rare gas column. However, it's predicted to have very unusual chemical properties which are shown here in non-relativistic and relativistic calculations. You see here uh, that the outer electrons uh, of organisson are highly non-localized uh, as, as is the case, for example, in the lighter uh, noble gases. Uh, on the nuclear side, organisson isotopes are predicted to have hollow proton distributions. You see this, um, this central depression here due to the Coulomb repulsion between the numerous protons in the nucleus. But in any case, it, it will take some time before these predictions can be verified uh, experimentally, but it's, it's very interesting chemistry and nuclear physics. And so what next? So this question has been addressed in a popular series. Some of you may know the Big Bang Theory. 
uh, some of the uh, um, reactions here have been in, indeed uh, tested. The problem is that theory, uh, it's a real challenge for theory to develop predictive models. Uh, here you have uh, predictions of different models uh, for different reactions, the cross section that one expects. And so uh, when you're dealing with the production of a, either one a, one a month or one every three months or one every week, it's a very different experimental situation. Uh, as I said, some of the, these uh, experiments have been done at, uh, at GSI with no uh, event observed. Currently in Riken, they're trying to produce element 119. And um, in Dubna, they have just finished building the so-called super heavy factory and experiments should start soon again. But is there an end? Um, the problem is that the, 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 new, the next super heavy elements that are, will be produced will in, in, in these reactions that we, fusion reactions on actinide targets on, they, they will have increasingly shorter lifetimes um, and they might not be even detectable in, in using a recall separator because the, the lifetimes predicted are getting dangerously under microseconds. Um, so um, the following, the other route that is investigating is to go a bit more neutron rich um, and so how does one go more neutron rich? One can try more exotic targets, but of course that, that uh, is a problem in terms of supply of radioactive material and also radio, uh, radiation protection. So if, if this is too active, you're limited to the number of atoms you can have in the target. Another way now is uh, looking into uh, another type of reaction, multinucleon transfer is a big thing now. Um, so this involves making uh, the ions of an actinide beam um, collide with another with an actinide target, and uh, by um, by relying on shell effects, which will uh, force one of the out of the outgoing partners to be magically like lead two hundred eight. The other one necessarily will be a very super heavy neutron rich partner, and there's some calculations already that are. Um, uh, out there and that predict very um, um, decent cross sections. Obviously this is for the production, but then the nuclei produced have to survive fission, which reduces considerably the, the cross sections, but still these are quite substantial cross sections and you get quite neutron rich nuclei. So there uh, have been encouraging experimental results already in, in few facilities and new projects are emerging such, such as for example, uh, the ERC Next project in Groningen, uh, or also the project of a multinucleon transfer factory uh, at Spiral 2 facility in France. Finally, I would have to say that if we never manage to manufacture in our lab laboratories the, the heaviest of these super heavy nuclei, we can perhaps indirectly try to evidence them thanks to uh, advanced simulations of the astrophysical uh, R process. Uh, that goes on in, for example, in, in star mergers uh, um, that we recently all witnessed uh, in, in, and that give rise to these gravitational waves, for example. In, this, in, in fact, in this, pro in this um, process, what, go what happens is like in the nuclear bomb where Gyorso identified is fermium and Einsteinium, you have rapid neutron capture process and su subsequent beta decays. And in fact, as is shown here in these plots, you start to populate quite heavy nuclei, which, which fission and then uh, provide new light fragments, which then continue to neutron capture. And, and there's this recycling of matter uh, until the neutrons are exhausted. And so in fact, the fission properties of these very heavy neutron rich nuclei, uh, they are the ones that are gonna govern the abundance uh, of, the, of, the, of the elements produced in such, um, in such astrophysical sites, as well as all the signals that come out of them like the kilo nova and so on. And then the, the open question, which still is, remains unanswered is uh, can, 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 nuclei long lived super heavy nuclei be produced in such uh, astrophysical sites. And there are some, um, some experiments underway um, to try and identify such super heavy uh, elements in nature. And so to conclude, I would have to say that we're, we've entered into a new period, chemically, obviously, 
but also technologically. In order to go further, we have to revise completely the way we go about things. But I'm sure the future will no, no doubt be full of surprises. And that's the end. Okay, thank you very much for this very much educating and very interesting talk.